good afternoon. Um, uh, this is CIBE 638, Sedimentation Engineering, and this is class number 132. That means 13th week, second lecture of two lectures a week that we have in this class. And I'm Professor Victor Pons from San Diego State University, Department of Civil Engineering. The subject today or this week or this part of the week, we're starting a new chapter on scour. Scour, as all of you may know, is the uh, erosion of the foundations of a bridge and then its consequent failure. Very important subject. Uh, the US government has spent a tremendous amount of time uh, trying to solve the problem of scour. And we're doing great efforts, I think, but not, nothing has not, not, not completely solved already. There's few failures, but there's also, we have to recognize the fact that um, the failures are related to the issue of hydrologic risk and we can never eliminate completely hydrologic risk. In other words, the frequency of design could be 100, could be 500. But if, if, if there was a flood of 1,000, then, then, then the thing will fail. And right now, we used to design bridges to up to 100. But now the recommendations are, because we have had so many failures, the recommendations are that we, that we increase for the scour design to 500. You can see that in the, in the manual. OK, so I'm sharing with you this, the, the syllabus. Is that correct? Okay, so now we go in here to Bridge Scour, uh, Federal Highway Administration, and uh, we're supposed to cover this this week, half, week 13 half, week 14 half, that's the Thanksgiving week, and then one half of week 15. We'll see touch and go there. We may not use all the three, uh, the three sessions, we'll see. It depends on how, how much length I take in each uh, on the cover on the coverage of each item, but let me start with the important if I, uh, the important uh, document in here, the document which is the source for just about everything, and it should be. It's an official um, Federal Highway Administration document dated 2012, and the title is "Evaluating Scour and Bridges." This document is also known as HEC or HEC. I heard it. I heard it as HEC. HEC 18, HEC 18 or HEC 18, circular, HEC for Hydraulic Engineering Circular number 18, Evaluating Scour Air Bridges, fifth edition. Can you believe that? And I really haven't followed through over the years as I have followed the other HEC of the federal government, the Hydrologic Engineering Centers, Davis, California uh, Computer Lab. I, I guess it's a lab but it's a lab to create digital models, computer models. So this one comes all the way from Washington, DC because it comes from the Federal Highway Administration, which is responsible for highways throughout the United States, particularly the interstate highway system, which was uh, created in the about 60 years ago in order to develop the whole interstate highway system through, in, throughout the United States or in the United States. So let's take a look at this um, report in here. It's a report in PDF. I think I can increase the, let me see if I can increase the, yeah, yeah, I can. Evaluating Scour Bridges. Very important document, very comprehensive document. It has about eight to step seven, 10 chapters and it covers just about everything that it needs to be covered on Scour dated 2012. And you would recall, I just already said it, that this is a fifth edition, right? is the fifth edition of the circular. So the circular, I am guessing, I've seen these editions off and on, but honestly, since I don't pay too much attention, I, I should say, I have not looked at all of them extensively as I had with the other manuals of the Army Corps, right? So I don't really, I don't have it in my mind the dates, but this, my guess would be that this book or rather this document would have started in its first version around 30 to 40 years ago. And the last one was 2012. And obviously every time we, we have a new document or a new version, it supersedes the older version. So we're gonna take a look at the last version. Interestingly the, enough, the, uh, the federal government has these pages, which are classical or right, I guess you could say stand, standardized pages to, to describe in one page, the entire document. So the title is Evaluating Scour Air Bridges. Let me see, can you guys look at it? Okay, that's a little better. Authors, Amison, 
Sevenbergen, Lagasse, and Klopper. And I recognize Pete Lagasse as one of my classmates, like Fred Thur. You, I, you have not, you guys have, uh, are not, per, not, perhaps have not heard me talk about Fred Thur, but those of you that are taking 634 have. Uh, Fred Thur was, uh, was one of my classmates that uh, went on to develop the Atkin model in SCS at the time, 1980. Now, this other gentleman, Pete Lagasse, I remember Pete very well. Uh, I haven't had too much to do with him, other than the fact that a couple, of three years ago, for some reason, I, I touched base with him on the phone, uh, Pete Lagasse. So he's the third author in this, um, he's my age, obviously, a little, yeah, about my age, I would say. Uh, these other gentlemen, Amison, uh, seven gentlemen or lady, I don't know, uh, Seven Bergen and Clapper, I do not know them. Okay, so this document is the fifth edition of HEC 18. It presents a state of knowledge and practice for the design, evaluation, and inspection of bridges for scour. And remember, I just said most bridges fail by scour failure. Uh, two companion documents which I am not gonna ask you to review, but I, you can reference if you get into this field because it is a field, entirely a field. People spend their lives doing this kind of stuff. HEC 20 is entitled Stream Stability and Highway Structures and HEC 23 is entitled Bridge Scour and Stream Instability Countermeasures. Okay. Okay, so that's the, the head uh, title for this document. And in the table of documents, we have introduction, Chapter two, designing and evaluating bridges to resist scour. Chapter three, basic concepts and definitions. And we're gonna get in there in detail, in extensive detail today. Chapter four, we're, we're, we're going to skip for the reason that we're not studying here, geotech engineering, which is kind of related. Interesting thing about this is that the geotech engineers handle also soil and we handle soils too, uh, hydraulic engineers, specializing in sedimentation also handle the soils. So we handle both the soils. So why could or would I say, I'm not talk, I'm gonna talk about geotech because that's not my job to talk about geotech. I already told you at the beginning, uh, this document recommends that when there's a design for scour, that three people participate in the design, the structural engineer who's responsible for the weight, the loads and so forth, um, live and dead loads, of course, uh, cars and, and trucks going through. And then the other two would be the geotech and the hydraulic engineer specializing in sedimentation or, or just hydraulic engineer. The hydraulic engineer in reality should, should know enough about scour. That's, scour is a fundamental calculation in hydraulic engineering. So with having said that, then I'm just gonna proceed in here. I'm going to skip chapter four, even though I'm giving it to you because it's, I couldn't split this document. I didn't want to split the document. I wanted you to have it completely. Uh, Long-term aggradation. I am going to briefly talk about this. It is important, but it's not so important as the actual contraction scour and uh, to two or three types of other scour which happen during a flood. The long-term aggradation and degradation don't happen during, during a flood. Those are systemic problems of the watershed. Uh, Typically on a long-term basis, there should not be any long-term aggradation and degradation. But the fact that there is reflects the issue that uh, watershed is subject to interventions which may cause aggradation and degradation. But the, so that's the subject, it's a long-term process. I'm going to try to uh, touch base briefly on this chapter five, but then I'm gonna to go to six and definitely I am going to talk about six extensively and seven, okay, six, six is, refer, is called uh, contraction scour. The contraction scour happens because bridge engineers typically contract the cross section. Why do they do that? And the answer is because they want to uh, uh, design a, a bridge that is not that expensive. Contracting the cross section means you're gonna, you're gonna cut the cross section into two and, and then you're gonna put some abutments in there and try to, try to make the, the river go through half of the channel that it normally does go. And that's no good, of course. In my opinion, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be done, but it is done and it is done quite frequently. So that's why we have contraction scour as a topic, an important topic, because there's gonna to be a lot of contractions out there. 
uh, then peer scour, the scour at the peer because of the location or existence of the peer. We, and that's one calculation, rather one topic here in this chapter. And then an abutment scour. The abutments are precisely the structures designed to, to, to put together the contraction with abutments. Usually if you have a contraction, they have abutments. If you don't have a contraction, you don't have abutments, right? And then finally, scour analysis, analysis. I'm gonna skip scour analysis for tidal waterways because we are not dealing with tidal waterways. Why not? The answer is, well, we don't have time uh, in this class to cover it. This is not a class in, in scour. I mean, we could spend the entire semester just examining in detail this particular document, okay? So waterways, waterways are the parts of rivers that actually come into the estuary, right? Tidal, tidal waterways, estuary waterways. And that's already kind of oceanic, you know, in the ocean. So we leave that for ocean engineers. We now have on our faculty, Professor Sepulveda, who is uh, an expert in ocean engineering and generation of waves and so forth. He just joined the faculty. I believe it was last year. Yes, that is correct. So SCAR analysis for tidal waterways, SCAR evaluation, inspection, and plan on action of action. As you can see, I told you that this is a very comprehensive report. It must have taken these two, four gentlemen, uh, these four authors, um, quite a long time to put together. My guess would be two or three years. That's the way it works. And this is a document which is about a hundred, a hundred uh, pages or more. And typically if you have a co-authorship like this, it takes a long time. This was done by the way, by private, it's usually done by private companies. The, the, the government, for some reason, I quite don't understand. The government does not do this, but they hire it out for a private company. Uh, and I happen to know because I'm going to fill in a story later on that uh, one of the originators of this idea as a, as a document for Scour was one of my professors, uh, Professor Richardson, uh, whom uh, was one of my mentors at Colorado State. I had three mentors at Colorado State. Uh, Simons was the chief or the head, and his assistant was Khalid Mahmoud. So I ended up working very closely with Khalid Mahmoud. But I also had uh, Rich, uh, he's uh, variously referred to as Rich, Professor Rich or Rich for Richardson. He was also my mentor, I should recognize. He gave me a few jobs to do and so forth. And I was always paying attention to what he said or what he did. Uh, Richardson passed away in the year 2012 or 13, I believe. At an old age, of course, he was my professor back in the year, back in the seventies. So by that time he would have been 50, I would have been 25 or 27. And uh, obviously the year 2012, he was, he, was, he was very old and he passed away. But before he passed away, he left a document talking about a video actually, talking about Colorado State University. How Colorado State University was put together over the years to be one of the premier hydraulic schools in the nation and the world. It's a very interesting document or video and I am, you know, Professor Pons is a lucky man. I happen to be friends or acquaintances with his son, Professor Richardson's son, who teaches over at Kansas, I believe, University of Kansas. And I got in touch with him because I wanted to know what had happened to Rich and, and I talked to his son. <laughs> you get the word from his son. And he did say that they had this document, this video, and I asked that he sent it to me, so he did. I have the video, I put it on YouTube and I will show it to you later on. It's a fascinating, interesting video, video, particularly for people like me that are graduates of Colorado State. So I'm gonna proceed in here. And I will, as has been my practice, I will touch upon several of these issues that are written in here. Uh, and then we'll see how we go along in uh, reviewing some of these ideas. We won't be able to do everything because it's too extensive. I will have to take 10 hours to describe in detail everything. And that's not the point. The, the point is not to make you a, 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 a scour expert. The point is to make you knowledgeable on what scour is and how it can be handled. That is the point. So in here, we're going to move on now getting into through the appendices or rather the 
preliminaries of the book. And now we're going to get to, to the chapter one, which is mostly the introductory material. Uh, that's a lot of a, a table. Look at this huge table. I'm going to run this a little bit more like this. Okay. Let's continue with the glossary definitions. An amazing, isn't it? Very comprehensive report, by the way. It must have been a tremendous amount of time. Look at this. 20% of the book, and we haven't even gotten to the body or the introduction. There we go. Purpose of this document is to provide guidelines for the following. Designing new and replacement bridges. Do bridges need to be replaced? Yes, because they probably are not uh, uh, up to snuff as far as the scour. Because bridges do fail by scour. As a matter of fact, I have an experience, personal experience. I happen to have a friend out there in somewhere in Ohio, and he had this personal experience, and he called me up to back, back up or verify what he was doing. He knew that I was a, a good guy in hydrology and he was a hydraulics guy. Well, anyway, he was doing hydrology too. So in 1998, 1998, right, he exposed me to his own experience in scour and bridge, in, in bridge scour failure. So I was able to go there, visit, learn from him and with him. And so I have that experience to share with you. And by the way, the only experience that I've had in scour well, I would say the only clear and definite experience that I have. I had a little experience, but that was the bigger one. Not everybody is experienced in everything, you know. I have a lot of experience with not necessarily in scour, but I believe we should treat scour in this part of the, uh, this class because it's important. Okay. The most common cause of bridge failures is from flood scouring bed material from around bridge foundations. That should be understood. Uh, I don't know the percentage, but my guess would be that. Um, I thought, I thought at one time, I thought at one time there was some idea that said that um, uh, 30 to 50% of the failures are from scour, but don't take my word for it. Let's just say that it is a lot. It has been recognized as being a serious problem in the US as well as around the world. Scour is the engineering term for the erosions caused by water of the soil surrounding a bridge foundation. So the water erodes the soil that surrounds a bridge foundation. The, the piers and abutments. And the piers have a depth. And that, that has to be in a design of a foundation of, the, of a bridge, uh, people are called upon to determine how, depth, how deep the pier should be. That's the way it is. Uh, so if the pier has, for instance, a depth of say 20 feet, or say, say 10, no, 20 feet is fine because we have that, these calculations that go all the way to 10 meters, which is 30 feet. So 20 feet, let's say, is an example. And with 20 feet, if the erosion is more than 20 feet, then the bridge will fail, for sure. As, as happened in Arizona, in Kingman. And I'm gonna let you know about those details later on. The spring floods of 1987, 17 bridges were damaged. In 1985, 73 bridges were destroyed in Pennsylvania, Virginia. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It goes without saying. It's a serious problem. And he, here it continues to move on and talk about how many experiences that we have. Comprehensive analysis. Three reports that I already talked about. This is particularly the the main one. Evaluating scour at bridges. Okay. So there is a flow chart in here, which kind of shows on the how old this report is. And I say that with a chuckle. It, when I grew up back in the early 70s, we, you couldn't write a report without a flow chart. Simply put, it was just in vogue. Nowadays, I don't see any new reports that are using flow charts. But this one does have it, which is a testament to the fact that this report has precedent. Excuse me. That this report is preceded by the discipline is preceded by uh uh let me just i have a phone here okay it's preceded by other reports okay i think we talked there's a phone ringing here okay so as you can see 18 23 complete flow charts 
And like I told you, I don't think you all, young fellas and ladies, you probably never seen a flow chart. I, I hope I'm not correct or I'm not saying anything to get you in the wrong track in here. But this is the fact, the flow charts were old or were, were used a lot at the beginning of the beginning of the very much detailed engineering. I started with it around 1970. So flow charts were very typical. But by 1990, they started to go away. But this uh, still has it. Okay, who's making noises out there? Okay. So procedural guidance, objective of a bridge scar evaluation prog program. Every bridge over water, because the bridges that don't go over water too, but it is a bridge over water, whether existing on, or under design, should be assessed as to its vulnerability to floods in order to determine the prudent measures to be taken. It's correct. Bridge scour, more so. This is inter all introductory material, okay? Uh, and here it refers to the, to the other report and some of the objectives of the reports, developing and implementing a SCAR evaluation, evaluating existing bridges for SCAR vulnerability. And that's important that they, it be done by some official uh, uh, institution like they have over here, the Federal Highway, because there's so many bridges out there that have been, that have been built, built over the last hundred years. And, and many of them have failed. Why have they failed? Because we were using a hundred years. We were using a hundred years of design frequency, 50 and a hundred years, and there was not enough. Because a 50, let's say a hundred, and a hundred year frequency does not mean, as a lot of people think, that it will come back in a hundred years or it will recur in a hundred years. In other words, that you have to wait a hundred years for it to happen. That is not correct. That is not correct. The correct statement is, if it happens tomorrow, it will take another, in, in, on the mean, that it will take a hundred years to happen. So it's not the same thing to say that it will, that it will not happen in 100 years. Let me repeat that. The first statement is, oh, a hundred year frequency is that it will not happen in a hundred years. That's the first statement. The correct statement is, if it happens tomorrow, it is likely that it will not happen in a hundred years. So it'll, it could happen tomorrow. Yes. And that's why we have so many failures. Advances in the state of practice of estimating scours, and they've got all kinds of reports in here of different situations and different topics like peers, geomorphology, co scouring cohesive materials, because not all the materials out there are erosion or sand and gravel. So in cohesive materials puts a little bit of a monkey wrench into the calculation, because while we know a lot about friction, we know very little about cohesion, because cohesion happens to have, to have a chemical characteristics where friction is purely mechanical, physical, mechanical, right? So I believe that we as engineers know a lot more and prefer to contend or to deal with friction than with cohesion. Okay, so all these reports that have been written that are set as reference at the beginning of this report. This is an official report, by the way. There's nothing more official on SCOUR from the federal government than this report. So it's comprehensive. And be precisely because it is comprehensive, maybe it's so big that it's hard to read. Perhaps what they should do is come up with a condensed summary of uh, the essence of the Jews for the practitioners. Maybe that's what they need to do. Organization of the manual, right? Dual system of units is amazing. The dual system of units, I don't wanna get into that issue of that argument. Why is it that we're using two systems of units? It's a long story. And like I said, I don't want to get in there. Uh, we use both uh, U.S. customary and, and SI, that is metric. These people here choose to use English, which is incorrect in my opinion. I don't know why they did that or why they keep doing that. There's two systems of units. The, the SI, System International in French, which is referred to loosely as metric, but the correct name is SI. And the other one is called U.S. customary because it is a custom to use in the US and only in the US because that system is not used elsewhere in the world. Although I should take that with a grain of salt because there are some countries out there that right or wrong use the US system. Mexico does it a little bit, particularly in Northern Mexico, they use the US system. In Southern Mexico or Central Mexico, no, they don't anymore because of the influence they use it. So I'm not gonna say that it's not used, that it's used only in the US, it's used in many other places. It's a well-known system. 
but it is not as, I guess you could say, technically corrected, corrected, correctly constructed like the SI system, which is, you know, a bunch of zeros, you know, the metric system is, is a decimal system and so forth. Let me stop in there. Okay. So designing and evaluating bridges to resist scour. Here we go. This is extremely important. This table is very important. Please, whoever is out there with uh, mic open and making noise, uh, cut it out, please. Okay, hydraulic design, scar design and scar design check flat frequency. So there's three levels in here. For the hydraulic design, flat frequency, Q10, 25, 50, and 100. And if you get to 100, the design frequency of 100, which was very common and continues to be very common throughout the US, and the SCAR design flood frequency is higher. Can you see 10 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 200? And then for SCAR design to check for the flood frequency. And this is described in here, the check, meaning you should check it for the site for flood frequency. And we get up to 500. That's the recognized number to 500. Because we have felt through practice over years of practice, 20, the last 20, 30 years, that perhaps the 100 is not enough and even the 200. So now they're using 500 in the official manual. We need to calculate the 500. Not to say that this is the end of the risk because all hydrology is a risk taking exercise. Why? Because well, how are you gonna calculate the 500 or the 100? You're gonna use some data out there, pick up the data. Or you can use the curve number, but the curve number is subject to a whole lot of variability, as we know very well. But if we pick up the data, we can pick up 50, maybe 80, 100 years of data. And we're going to go extrapolate to 500? Yes, it's done. But, but it is a risk. There's, oh, we always take a, a risk in there. Uh, but needless to say that the 500 number is better than the 100, better than the 200 and better than the 100. So it's an improvement in terms of the safety of the design. It would be nice for us to put a thousand in there. Why don't we put a thousand? Uh, somebody could say, why don't we put a thousand in there? And the answer is, it'll cost more. Society will have to spend a whole lot of money. And it may not be, well, let's put it now, not, I, I'm not gonna say counterproductive, but it, it will not be, it may not be cost effective in the long run. And those are, these are all statements that Professor Fons is saying in here because he wants to say, cost effective in the long run. What does that mean? 500 year return period is exactly how many generations? Four times, 20 generations, 20 generations is 500 year return period. A generation is 25. We design a, a piece of work or a bridge or a dam or whatever for 500 years and 20 generations are going to benefit from that design. So if it doesn't fail in 500 years, the first two generations would have paid for the structure and the other 18 uh, basically didn't pay, right? Because it is extremely hard to amortize the cost of a structure among four generations, let alone two generations is hard, let alone four and even more. So as you can see this is issue of practicality, how far are we willing to go along in trying to avoid failure by increasing the frequency? The, the, the so-called frequency, the name frequency, which is 500 in this case. Let me ask, let me share a little story in here. When I was in uh, Portugal back in the year 1995, I believe, I think it was 1995. No, no, take that back. It was 19, no, it was not, no, excuse me. It was 86 when I went on my first sabbatical. And then I took a, a road trip and went to Spain, 1986, with friends. I had students, friends out there. And we crossed the border between Portugal and France. I'm not, it's not in France, Portugal and Spain. And there was a bridge out there. There was a bridge out there that purportedly was 2,000 years old. So my friend said, uh, Professor Ponza, there's a Roman bridge in here. I said, really? Interesting. So we went and looked at the bridge and took some pictures of it. Unfortunately, I don't have those pictures. 1986, it's a long time. I honestly don't have those pictures. I don't think I, I can pull them out. Okay. At the beginning, I didn't have a good filing system for my photos. 
But the point I'm trying to make in here is that we actually confirmed that in fact, that bridge was Roman because it had Latin inscriptions on top of the bridge. I believe that bridge is called, I don't remember the name right now, but we confirmed that it was a Roman bridge. I mean, there was no fooling anything, anybody. That bridge had been standing there for 2000 years. So then the question here that we need to answer is, how come our bridges are failing and the Roman bridge is still standing there after 2000 years? It's a very good question, very valid question. And the answer is because the Romans were not using hydrology. We are using hydrology because the 500 year flood is supposed to last for 500 years and so be, so be it. But they weren't using hydrology. They had no way of calculating any hydrology. They just did it because they had to do it. They were an empire around all, all Europe. And they used, mind you, they used labor, slave labor. They used slave labor. They didn't pay. Nowadays, we couldn't use slave, slave labor. If a bridge is going to be designed for 500 years, we got to pay every, every ounce or every element of uh, wages there is for people to actually build a bridge. Out there, it was a different time, and they were using slave labor. They conquered people. They obliged them to do the work. And it was cheap for them. Besides, they were an empire. They were an empire that had broad views on all Europe, all the world, you know, the world as they knew it at the time. So they were going to do it, and they did it. And that's why their projects still stand 2,000 years later. It's just about one example that I have lived through of how these structures last longer than our structures. Our structures sometimes fail. There was an example in Mexico. They put together the new, the new road between Mexico City and Acapulco. That was five, 10 years ago. Within two years, the major bridge connecting the road, I mean, the locations failed due to the scour, by the way. It failed, it came down completely. So then there's a question of how come the bridge only lasted two years? Probably I would venture to say, I didn't analyze the data, but I would venture to say that poor design against scour because scour, it was like that. It failed due to scour. Okay, so. Okay, guidance in this chapter, interdisciplinary team. This is where I referred to this before. The interdisciplinary team needs to apply engineering judgment by comparing results obtained from scour computations with available hydrologic and hydraulic data and conditions of the site to achieve a reasonable and prudent design. And here I want to say something important. All right, uh, well, I'm not eating shit, so that's good. Excuse me? Is that Margo? Okay. Please shut your mic in here if you are open. Okay. So computations. Okay, the point that I'm trying to make in here or that I'm going to make in here is that one thing is to do a calculation and we will do a calculation. We have calculators for all the three or four major um, formulas that this report covers. Formulas that HEC, uh, HEC RAS has in their mind manuals too. The typical formulas, the HEC 18 formula. This, this report has a formula called HEC 18, which is the same, the, the formula from the report. But that doesn't mean that the design is gonna be correct. We would have to put it to test the experience, the engineering judgment of the designer. That's why a, that's why a the person that choose to head the design, the major designer has to be a man or a woman experienced in these issues of design of, sky, of bridges against scour. It can't just be a, a lady or gentleman that has only one hour, one year, excuse me, one year experience and has done three projects. You have to do 20, 30, 20, 30 years of experience. That's the way it should be done. That's the way it's normally done, by the way. General design procedure. So I'm gonna skip this part because we're gonna we're gonna get in there eventually, by the way. Eventually we're gonna get there. Spread footings. You can have drive drive piles for footings, and I'm gonna give you an example later on, or you can have spread footings. Spread footings is footings that are spread and you know distribute the load is distributed in the soil. 
And as you can see, when you're talking about spread footings and stuff like that, you got to engage the geotech engineer, which who is the one that is going to is going to determine the bearing capacity and so forth, which normally hydraulic engineers don't deal with. So as you can see, the absolute need for an interdisciplinary team. Why is it that the bridges had failed a whole lot in the last 30, 40 years? Because it used to be, let me say so if I can say that, that 40 years ago, the bridge design was the responsibility and the task of solely of the structural engineers. The structural engineers went out there, determined the loads, live loads, dead loads, and so forth, and they put the bridge on top of the river, and that's it, and they walked away from the job without realizing or wanting to realize that it was not just that, that there was gonna be a water load in there and there was gonna could put in danger the stability and, and, and life of the structure. And they weren't doing it that way. They weren't. And when we realized, society realized that there was a hydraulic issue in there, this is when people started talking about scour and hydraulics and so forth and involving the, the hydraulic engineers. I say that because I happen to be in the know. Uh, back in the early 60s or late, late, I'm sorry, middle 70s, my professor, Richardson, one of my three professors, got a contract with the Federal Highway to teach him hydraulics, Federal Highway to the bridge designers of the Federal Highway to teach them hydraulics. So that's exactly what I just said earlier. They didn't know. And uh, since he was well recognized in the field, he, he got that contract and he involved in the, in the work, none other than your professor. I was involved in that, in working on that contract. He was giving a contract to produce a manual, hydraulic and hydrologic design considerations in bridge design. If in the mid seventies, the federal highway needed that manual it's because they didn't have it. That goes without saying, right? And I participated tangentially. I mean, I was not the lead investigator or anything like that. That was Richardson, that was my professor. But he gave me a few jobs and so forth and I was able to participate. And I even have that, the copy of that report. He subsequently went on to teach that class. It was a class, it has a report that was about a couple hundred, 300 pages that I put together over like maybe six months or nine months. And he got paid for it. And then, and then they proceeded to use him and others at Colorado State to teach the hydraulic engineers throughout the United States or the bridge engineers, I'm sorry, the bridge engineers how to learn hydraulics so that they could deal with the, with the problem of scour, which was very prevalent at the time. So you see, I have experience in this. I wasn't just born yesterday. I have lived through that experience. Okay, so spread footings, abutments, and so forth. Design considerations. This is a very detailed, but actually a good comprehensive. I would say nearly complete. I'm not gonna say complete because I don't really know the subject enough to say it is complete. If you wanna do that, you have to work in SCOUR for five years and I have not done so. I already told you two or three experiences isolated does not make it does not make an expert. Piers, abutments, I already told you what the difference between piers and abutments. Piers are usually columns. Abutments are sides of the, uh, of the river where the water, the water or the river flows by the abutment, not through the abutment. Okay, superstructures, that is the bridge itself, okay. Buoyancy, drag forces, these are all mechanical issues here. Floating debris and ice, yes, in some places, particularly in the Northern United States, you can have problems with floating debris and ice would get put in danger the stability, the stability of the structure. If the debris gets to a structure and it, and, and it, it cannot pass through and it could pressure the structure, in some instances, the structures have failed due to lateral lateral forces because most structures are not designed for to, to sustain lateral forces. And in this case, you sustain lateral forces from debris and ice, it could fail. And it is my understanding that some bridges, a few bridges have failed in that way. Ice forces, that's why they are treated in here, in this manual. If it were not important, they wouldn't treat it. Debris forces, ice forces, detailed procedures and specific des design approach. all the history of how we put this thing together, determine the man magnitude of long-term degradation or aggradation. Okay, this is a secondary issue, but it's, it's important enough that it is treated here. As I already told you, there's gonna be long-term aggradation or degradation if there, is, if there is natural and or anthropogenic disturbances in the watershed, 
and there's degradation or aggradation, and that would have to be added or subtracted from the from the contraction and local scour in order to come up with a total figure for scour. You don't want to do a calculation, a local contraction or local scour calculation, and then find out that uh, that the stream bed degraded a couple or three feet due to long term or, or spatial spatial issues, which had to do with some other forces, not necessarily the force of the hydraulics impinging on the bridge. You see there's other forces. So we need to keep that in mind or at least mention it in here as we get started with this. Okay, I'm trying, I'm having a lot of trouble here. Okay, let me see if I can go, okay, here we go. So evaluate the hydraulics, the total scour depths, scour evaluation philosophy and concepts for existing bridges. So I'm going to just kind of follow here and get directly to, to three. Basic, this is three, this is important. Basic concepts and definitions of scour. In this chapter, there is an issue of, um, of definitions that I'm going to deal with today and I'm going to discuss it with you. Okay, let me just keep going in here. Total scour. What is the definition of total scour? Total scour is the amount, the total amount of scour consisting of three primary components. Long-term degradation, I already told you that. Usually scour is degradation, it's not aggradation. Contraction scour at the bridge. Why contraction scour? I already told you. Uh, engineers, designers, Architects of the bridge, which are usually high, uh, structural engineers, by the way, structural engineers, in conjunction with architects. If the structural engineer wants to hire an architect to do part of the work, he can do so, or they can do so. Typically, they work together, as a matter of fact, architect and engineer, engineering companies. If the issue is one of a building, generally the boss is the architect. If they hire the structural engineers, they hire the installation, electrical installation, they hire the geotechs, they hire everybody. The architects are the bosses, actually. The ones that deal directly with the boss. Well, I mean, not with the boss, but the, the owner of the structure. Now, and that's in case of a building. But in the case of a bridge, I honestly don't know. My guess would be that the structural engineers are in charge. I had some dealings with a company in town whose name I don't want to remember. That, uh, I mean, I don't remember, actually. I'm sorry I said that. Uh, I don't want to remember sounds like like bad, no, the same I don't remember, it's been 30, 40 years. And they were in charge of largely a majority of the bridges in town at the time. Contraction scour at the bridge, that I just talked about that. And local scour at the piers. So this local scour has nothing to do with contraction scour, by the way, contraction scour is a, geotech, is a hydraulic problem. Local scour is a sedimentation problem. That's the difference, the, the emphasis. The contraction scour is a lowering of the stream bed at the bridge. Lowering may be uniform across the bed or uniform, that is the depth of scour may be deeper in some parts of the cross section. Contraction scour results from contraction of the flow, which results in removal of material from the bed across all or most of the channel. And why contraction? Because I already told you, designers of bridges generally contract the bridge, contract the width of the channel along the bridge because they feel that that's cheaper. They don't realize, I think, that in the long run, that is kind of productive because it will be some time in the future, typically 20, 30 years when the bridge is gonna be subjected to very strange and very strong forces that are gonna to try to destroy the bridge because of the existence of the contraction. Local scour involves the re material, removal of material from around the piers because the bridges have piers. How many? Depends on the design. It could have 10, 15, 20 piers. There's a bridge out there that I took a picture. I should show it to you. Maybe, maybe next meeting, next Tuesday. A bridge up in the San San Joaquin, I believe. It's the San Joaquin River, up northern California. Actually, not northern California. It's in southern California. And the San Joaquin River is in southern California. It's in uh, it's in the Central Valley, the south of the Central Valley, San Joaquin. There's a bridge out there that has about 25 piles. I don't know how many they put a whole lot of piles out there. Uh, spears, spears, which is piles. Same thing. Actually, not quite. Piers is the correct name. Okay. Remove the material from piers around the abutments too is local scour and embankments. It is caused by the acceleration of flow resulting from the, pres from the presence of the, of the structure. 
around which the scour, the local scour is going to take place. Other types of scour go around the bend, et cetera. That's not, not that important. Lateral stream migration, how fascinating. This is interesting. Actually, can a river go somewhere else? And the answer is yes, it happens. How is it possible? Well, we actually have an experience. I should, I should bring out my examples of bridges that can go somewhere else. Yes, I have a few. Uh, why? Why can the bridges go somewhere else? Because if there's a bridge on top of a, of a meandering channel, the meander would like to move. It will move eventually. Eventually, all meanders move. And if they move, they can leave the premises and go somewhere else. A, a, one case, particular case, which was not really a movement of the, rip, of the river, but it was in effect uh, the losing of the capability of the bridge to function as is. And that was in the flood of 1983, which I lived through in Santa Cruz River in Arizona, in uh, the Cortero, next to the Cortero Bridge, or actually, I think it was the Cortero Bridge. The three bridges are there, Continental, Congress, and Cortero. And I studied that for my hydrologic uh, model of 1985. And one of those bridges, uh, what happened was that the flow came, the flow of October 30th, 1983, which kind of related to El Nino, by the way, because that was a very strong El Nino year, the strongest of the century. And you would know that the El Nino has an effect throughout the Pacific, to the east, throughout the Eastern Pacific, uh, uh, going all the way from Peru, from middle Peru to California. It gets through here in this area. So it had a great effect out there in Arizona and caused a lot of damage in the Santa Cruz River that at the time was maybe, I don't know, I'm going to guess in here. I've seen this data, but I don't have it at this point. It's been more than 30 years. It could have been maybe a couple hundred feet width, the width of the, of the, of the channel and the width of the bridge because the bridge spanned the width of the channel like normally they would do. There's no reason to do anything else. But actually the flood came and they, it eroded. It basically increased the width of the channel, say from 200 to 300 feet. You know, in the, in the additional 100 feet, there was no, no, no bridge out there. So the bridge, the structural part of the bridge was not damaged, but the bridge was put out of function or out of operation because there was a big hole on the side about spanning about a third of the, of the total length. That of course had to be fixed later on. So those things could happen. Another experience we have in, uh, in the Santa Cruz River, how about that? The same name for both a river in Arizona and uh, another one in Eastern Bolivia, which I worked on extensively in the year 1989. In the Santa Cruz River, they also, uh, in parts of this, actually it's the Santa Cruz River. They also had that experience where they had a bridge over there. It was, um, it was a, a, a bridge for a, a rail bridge, you know, and uh, the river moved, went, some, went somewhere else and left the bridge out there. Not, the bridge wasn't, wasn't serving for any purpose anymore because it was outside of the, of the river. And that happened and I, I actually do have pictures of that. I'm gonna try to put a, together a collection of pictures so I can show you throughout my collection that I can show you next time visually so you can see what I am talking about. It's always a good raster picture is always image, raster image is always better than just telling you the story in the cold. Okay, so we proceed then. Long-term stream bed elevation changes. There's aggradation and degradation. I already told you that that is an important subject but not one that deals directly with the problem of cont contraction in local scour. Here is where the magic starts. Clearwater and live bed scour. I have read this section many times and I've read it in many other places and I still don't have fully 100% understanding. And I don't think you guys will either because it is hard. Okay, let's go, let's go for it. There are two conditions, conditions for contraction and local scour. In other words, they're saying in here that there's contraction scour, which is not local scour and local scour is not contraction scour. Construction scour is general, local scour is local as its name implies, okay? But these have two conditions. Each one of them have two conditions. Oh, each one has two conditions, clear, cower, clear water and live bed. Well, let's define what these conditions are. Clear water scour 
occurs when there is no movement of the bed material in the flow upstream of the crossing or in the bed material being transported in the upstream reach. Or no, or the bed material being transported in the upstream reach is transported in suspension through the hole at less than the capacity of the flow. This is the part I don't understand. At less than the capacity of the flow. Because I understood that the, the capacity of the flow is, is the capacity of the flow. So if it's less than the capacity of this, unsteadiness in there that are, it's going to be very hard to discern because less than the capacity has to be unsteady. So if it's unsteady, then, then you're talking something else in here, something more difficult because unsteady flow sediment is a lot more difficult than steady sediment. And these guys have not gotten, re gotten really into unsteady sediment. They're still dealing with uh, steady sediment. Unsteady sediment implies sediment routing. And these guys are not doing any routing in here, okay? So at the pier abutment, the acceleration of the flow created by these obstructions caused the bed material around them to move, okay? At that point, now we're gonna get into the definition of live bed scour. Live bed scour occurs where there is transport of bed material from the upstream region to the crossing. Live bed local scour is cyclic in nature. That is the scour hole that develops during the rising stage of a flood refills during the falling stage. That is true, by the way. We recognize it to be truth, to be the truth. So in here, what is not clear exactly is the exact definition of why one, one condition is called clear water and the other one is called live bed because they're both are transporting a certain amount of sediment. The only difference is that they say, or they argue that in the clear water case, there's very little sediment. Well, in the live bed, there's a lot of sediment. But one thing that distinguishes these two is the fact that the live bed scour is local and it will have a tendency to erode during the rising limb or rising stage and fill during the falling stage. That is a true, the, a truism. In other words, when there is a, um, a, um, a flood and there is an occurrence of live bed scour, What's going to happen is you're going to have the piers, right? However many piers you have, you can have five or 10 or 20, like in that case of the San Joaquin River. So the piers are out there. There is erosion around the piers due to the mechanics, due to the circulation of the flow. The flow is forced to circulate around the piers because it has to go around and back open up again. That circulation, it creates vortices and so forth. So that's the live bed scour. But what's going to happen, it has happened, it's been documented, is that it will create a scour hole. It will create a scour hole because that's exactly what's going to do, depending, and the scour hole will be as deep as the duration of the flood. If the flood lasts long enough, the scour hole will, be, will go very deep and it may endanger the stability of the structure if it actually hits the bottom of the pier, right? That it does not hit the bottom of the pier, of the pier all the time, attests to the fact that not, not all rivers fail and not all bridges fail. Okay, but the point that I'm trying to make in here, and these people also make, is that they make a hole during the rising stage, which progresses, and if, if the hole is not that deep, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right, if the hole is not that deep, the bridge is not going to fail. But then on the receding limb, the falling stage of the flood, and all floods go up and come down, that's why they're called floods, the, the, the vortices, vortices lose their energy and they start filling up. And by the time the, the flood uh, finishes and you go in there and inspect, there's no hole. The hole disappeared. Because like they say in here quite correctly, it, it, uh, it was created during the rising limb and then deposited during the receding limb. So what happens is that the result of this whole thing is that sometimes the bridges fail slightly, slightly, okay? So let's assume for a minute here, for purposes of explanation, that you have a, that you have a, a pile that is 20 feet. Okay, so the scour hole starts and it goes to 10, 15, 20, 19, 20. It goes to 21, the bridge starts failing, and then all of a sudden it recedes and it starts filling up, and by the time everything settles down, there's no hole. So we wonder what happened. How come the bridge decided that it was going to start failing when there is no hole? Where's the hole that caused the failing? And the answer is the hole got filled up during the failing. That's exactly what these guys are saying. And by the way, something that we have proven to be the case 
in practice. And everybody acknowledges that that is the case. And I have an example, by the way, a case study to show you later on when we finish this document, which will probably would be uh, next week. Contraction scour, basic conditions for contraction scour. Like I said, I don't like contraction scour. I think the bridges should be built, all of them, to the width of the river, to the, to the bank width of the river, but they are not. And I'm not in the power to oblige or you know, told, told, tell these people to do the right thing because it's gonna fail eventually, you see? So that's the situation. Local scour. Here's the local scour and here are the horseshoe, horseshoe vortices that I was talking about, okay? That create the holes. Bridge pier flow field. And then some nice pictures over here of the vortices, horseshoe field, transition piers. And I'm going to go in here a little fast because we are running out of time here. Are some nice pictures, what actually happens of some graphs actually. Okay, this is the situation with the abutments. Can you see that's an abutment? That is a construct contraction that should not be done in my opinion, to the extent possible, of course. If you have to build a bridge and you want to build a cheap or bridge, consider that it can fail and it will fail the minute it, it gets charged or it gets loaded through its capacity, it will fail. You cannot stop water from its force, from its actual force. That has been known for many, many, many years. When water starts rushing, it, 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 could, it can do anything, absolutely anything. And we know that for a fact. Maybe, maybe uh, many of you perhaps have avoided flooding through your lifetime, but it's there. I've seen it. I was in um, in uh, Southern Brazil in the year, I don't recall what year it was, 82 or 83, I think. And they had a huge flood. Actually, it was a huge storm. And I was flying down to the, the city of, I believe it was Santa Catarina. Yeah, Santa Catarina or some other city out there. I had, it, I had been invited to give a lecture out there back in the year 82 or 83. And I thought, honestly, I was going to die because the plane was going through the storm and the storm was a real bad storm. I'd never seen anything like that. I've never, again, was put in that situation. And I said, that's the end of Professor Ponce. But to my luck, it didn't happen. Just the plane weathered the storm and landed and so forth. But landed where? It landed in the town and the town was subject to flooding. And boy, I saw things. I have even said pictures of that. I saw things, I promise you pictures and I will get some pictures together for next week. Some pictures of flooding. I had to go through that, through that uh, event of flooding in that particular town that had almost killed me in, upon landing while visiting. And it was amazing. The, the uh, water was on top of the roofs of the houses. And I saw it. I saw it from an embankment because I was in, you know that the embankments are always built up high because they don't want the embankments which carry the road, uh, in a road embankment to get flooded easily. So I, I was able to look at that, but I can see that it was a major problem. Um, that particular valley, the Atajai Valley is a very flood prone valley. I can tell you stories on that, but I'm not going to because we don't have the time. Um, I was there twice actually for the purposes of flooding in the early, in the early 80s. Okay, so in here, other types of scour, as you can see, this this, this uh, very comprehensive. General chapter four, geotech. I'm not going to cover chapter, geotech. I am not a geotech engineer, so I'm, I'm gonna skip that. Those of you that are interested or that are actually geotechs, because I know that this class has uh, 13 students and not all of you are specializing in hydraulics or environment. There's a few there that are, could be, I know one of them is construction and there could be, could be one geotech also. So you may be interested in this geotech part of the hydraulic manual. We all do the same kind of job and we all get together to properly do the designs. There's no difference when it comes down to working together. We work together with structures, people, geotech people, environmental and so forth. The objective is to get the job done, not to quarrel among each other as to who is more important than others. That's of course, obviously no good. Okay, so erosion rates, 
that's geotech also with the geotech um, the geotech capabilities i'm going to confess to you that at the early part of my career i started as a geotech engineer but then i switched to hydraulics because i thought I, hydraulics was going to be more broad much broader and more interesting nothing to say bad about the geotech engineers i have very good friends professor valdez is my, my very good friend he's a geotech engineer and there's a couple of others out there at san diego state uh, Okay, so that's geotech and all this stuff, all the stuff that you guys have learned, the compaction and so on and so forth. This, the first time I'm gonna tell you a story which I cannot avoid telling you. The first time we, we worked on, uh, in the field, we had to do an, a test embankment. The test embankment is, is for the purpose of figuring out where, the, where the, the, the soil is gonna come from and how it works in terms of this, of, of this um, usefulness is, is embankment or soil for the embankment. So we did this test embankment and we were testing it and we, are in, we were in charge at the time very early in my career, by the way, I had just been out of school. We set up a lab to test, uh, to test the soil because, um, in the test embankment. And we did that, we were doing that. We did that for six months. And um, so we went out there in the field with our crews and did a lot of proctor tests, proctor. That's Proctor right there, standard laboratory compaction test, Proctor test. And, um, and then we proceeded to plot the, the tests. And if you look at the geotech books, they plot, they say that the, that the, um, the maximum, that there's a maximum density associated with a certain moisture level. And then there should be a parabola in there. So the peak, you, we find the moisture, the optimum moisture for the most dense, that's a proctor test. So we did a whole lot of proctor tests, maybe 20, 30, 50. And we plotted them all in one sheet of paper and it did not define properly the parabola. So I thought at the time being naive and lack of experience, I said, well, maybe we didn't do it right. But I wasn't gonna back up and I said, no, we did what we had to do. We followed the procedures and so on and so forth. So I presented to the supervisor who was a gentleman from Yugoslavia, Dr. Anagnosti, I remember his name to this day. I said, uh, doctor, we've got this test in here. We got 50 test practice tests and they plot in here. Looks good, but it doesn't look good, meaning it doesn't follow the book. So I am going to apologize. I said, I don't really know what exactly happened, <laughs> but we did the best we could. <laughs> the guy said, the gentleman said, Pons, don't worry. He said, Pons, Pons, right? My name, Pons. Don't worry about it. This happens, this happens all the time. He was a, an older man. I was like maybe 25, 28, 30. Not really. 25. I was 25. And he was maybe 50 or 45 or 50. So he had a lot more experience. And he brushed it aside and he said, don't worry. This happens all the time. So that's a story to show that book theory or book knowledge is not exactly as practical knowledge. We were out there in the field doing practical knowledge. So that's just in soil, but it happens everywhere. It happens in hydraulics and structures everywhere, okay? Hydraulic conductivity, that's all soil, soils. Now we're gonna move, move into, oh, we're already finish, finishing up here. So I'm gonna go into the next chapter and just gonna review, review again with you what, uh, my friends over Federal Highway said about the number six, five, five in here. Uh, yeah, I'm finishing here, five, chapter five. I'm not gonna go into chapter five, I already told you. That's a, di a different story altogether. So we're really gonna move on directly here into chapter six and spend the next 15 minutes, not even, that I have into chapter six. Contraction scour and the definition of contraction scour. And remember, there is two conditions, the clear water and the live bed. We already talked about that. And in here, they explained it more in detail. The live bed contraction scour occurs at the bridge when there is transport of bed material in the upstream reach into the bridge. With live bed contraction scour, the area of the contracted section increases until in the limit, the transport of sediment out of the contracted section equals the sediment transported in. And the clear water scour is when there is no bed material transport for the upstream reach. Usually the clear water scour, they say in here, that is related to cobble streams or streams that hardly have any sediment. Well, live bed is when there's se se sediment being moved around. So that's the story, basically. 
I think that is the correct story. The clear water is when you have cobalt streams that don't move a whole lot of sediment. While live bed contraction is when there's a whole lot of sediment coming from upstream and moving around, which is the more typical, by the way. I would tend to think that is the more typical. Okay, so that's the story here now. To calculate the critical velocity, the critical velocity for the movement, that is the critical velocity that we study in, hydro, in, uh, in sedimentation engineering, which we already have covered. But interestingly enough, these guys over here have their own equations for critical velocity, which are specialized for use in scour formulas, which is the 6-1 in here, the critical velocity above which a bed material of size D and smaller will be transported in meters per second and feet per second. K sub U is a coefficient, which is brought out of the air, by the way. K sub U is SI units, English units, and the Y to this one six power, the depth of one six power. One six power is very common in these types of equations, by the way, and the D to the one third. Needless to say, this is an empirical equation. I don't like empirical equations, but I can't go through against the manual. All I can say is, well, 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 you know, but this is an empirical equation. In most of the scour equations, I, if, if not all, are empirical. Why in this day and age? Well, the issue is that we still do not have a, a good model, physical and mechanical model of three-dimensional movement of sediment. Einstein started the, in 1950 doing the one-dimensional. We have tried over the years to do two dimensions, but we haven't gotten into three dimensions yet. So in the scour is a typical three dimensional problem. So if and when we get there, we'll get there, but we haven't gotten there yet. So we need to use equations like six one, which are empirical. That's the rationale. Contraction scour cases. There's several cases in here and I'm gonna go over, I'm not gonna go over in, in it by detail. I'll have you on your own look at it. Abutment projects, abutment projected, that's a standard typical plan, right? Which is no good, I already told you. So this one is a cross section of the bridge. Abutment set back from the channel, that's good. That's good, that's better. Cross section downstream. Plan view. Bridge abutments and piers constrict the flow. That is right, they constrict the flow. They make the flow faster. When they make the flow faster, it has to carry more sediment. It will start picking up sediment and God knows what could happen. That is why this problem is a tough problem and why a lot of people spend their lives doing it and many fail, by the way. Many actually fail. Yep. We have a recent example in Peru, 19, 2017 in Lima, in the town where I was born many years ago. Uh, they built a pedestrian bridge over the, over the ma major bridge over there, the, the Rimac River. And the pedestrian bridge was, was, uh, was like uh, founded on one side. It was like, um, what do you call that? Suspended bridge. But on the other side, it was just, just had a huge abutment and it was, it was placed on the soil, on the cross section. And they felt that, you know, the river's always been like that and nothing's gonna happen. So they went ahead and, and built that bridge. Two years later, the 2017, the big flood came. Nobody presumed that that was the case or that was gonna happen. Huge flood, that was, that was the El Nino year, very strong El Nino year, 2017. And you know what the, the flood did? It eroded the base of the abutment, of the abutment that they had put in there. And the abutment fell into the river, not to be found again. Can you believe that? And of course, the entire structure failed, collapsed. So engineers say out there kind of jokingly that the abutment didn't fail. It's just sat into the river and collapsed. It was, in other words, from the foundation standpoint, it was correctly designed. But from a hydraulic sedimentological standpoint, it was poorly designed. Why? Because we don't know to this date about lateral transport. We know at, about transport in the bed. Einstein has instructed us on the transport in the bed, but not in the transport on the side of the channel. And this happened in the side of the channel. So I guess the designers are justified in saying that that's new material, we never covered it. In. And they are correct. Nobody would have any inkling that this was going to happen, that the river was going to come very strong, erode everything that it needed to erode, 
And it was not enough because he wants to carry more sediment because he comes with a whole lot of strength and he wants the velocity is, you know, uh, carry, wants to carry a whole lot of sediment. He started eating the sides of the river. And one of the sides had held the abutment. So the abutment was gone. I actually have a picture, a video of that particular failure. And I will strive to show it to you next time. Okay. So this case is, the cases that they're talking about here. And then we, they move on to the live bed contraction scour, which again is an empirical formula. I, that's all I have to tell you. They're all empirical, they're all empirical formulas because there is, there is still no sediment transport model in three dimensions. And we're talking here three dimensions, spiraling movement and so forth. So that's another equation. And there's yet another equation. This is the equation by Larson, which is a very well-known guy, very respected guy in the field. This is his formula. The three seven, I don't know, it strikes me from where did they get this thing? But I'm not gonna argue with Larson. I will die, I mean, I will lose if I did that because I don't have the experience to discuss his, his uh, methodology. All I can say is that his method does look old. Is it old? Yes, it is old, 1963. That's 60 years old, 60? Yeah, 60 years old, exactly, almost 60 years old. Larson is a very well-known person in the field of sedimentation, by the way, but this stuff is old. Is it old? Has it not been superseded? It must not have been superseded because this report dates 2012. And these guys are practitioners in the scour area. If they were not practitioners in the scour area, they would not have been hired to write this report. Right, that's obvious, right? Contraction scour with backwater and so on and so forth. Examples, the good thing about this is examples, right? Examples with the use of the Larson equation. Contraction scour in co cohesive materials. The cohesive materials throw a monkey wrench in the process, always, always. I would, uh, the cohesive materials are always an unknown. And, and th this is one of the issues that makes uh, geotech engineering some sort of a magic uh, practice because we all know friction, the angle of friction and very clearly defined and so on and so forth. But cohesion, very little known because it involves chemistry. And we typically engineers don't deal very much or very, very good with chemistry. And that is the problem. When dams fail, let me put you another story. I'm gonna finish in here. Where dams fail mm -hmm. by piping is typically, typically chemistry. You know, the piping is a chemistry problem. And that's why when we uh, have a piping problem like they had in Teton Dam, the Bureau of Reclamation had a piping problem in Teton Dam and they didn't recognize it and they wouldn't do anything about it and they failed tremendously. You guys have heard about the failure of Teton Dam in the year 1975 up in Idaho. It just piped throughout and it failed. The issue is chemical because of cohesion because we don't know enough about the chemistry of cohesion. So with that, I am going to say that I have already finished this chapter, more or less, and I'm gonna ask you to just kind of breeze or browse over it. And basically when I come back, I'm gonna show you the pictures that I've already promised, and then I will get into the other subjects, related subjects, because we still have two sessions to go on this. On this. I do, uh, uh, recognize the extensive amount of work that these people, these four people have done, by the way, in putting this report together. It's not an easy thing to put a report like this together. And while I may raise an eyebrow at the empirical equations, I recognize and I repeat that it was and it continues to be the state of art, the state of the art in the practice of scour. As reflected in the famous HEC-18 formula, which HEC-18 comes HEC-18 is this report. So the HEC-18 formula must be the formula that originated in this report, which is a correct statement. Okay, so with that then, I have done chapter six and I'm not gonna do chapter seven because we're gonna cover this in some other area. So in the next time I have, I'm gonna, in the next section I have, I'm gonna show you all the pictures that I promised and the videos and so forth. And then I will move on to the, my own writing on this subject which I have done some. At this point, I would like to stop the class or stop the, the, I stopped the sharing already. So I do wanna say in closing 
that we have a one one session next week, Tuesday. We're going to continue talking about scour or describing the issues of scour. And then, then following Tuesday, we're going to go into the calculations and the Melville equation. The end of this whole section will be the Melville equation, which is a very comprehensive way of calculating scour, developed by uh, Professor Melville, I believe, out of Australia. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, well, well recognized, 20 year old, 1997 equation for scour. Very well recognized. Perhaps the most comprehensive to date, the Melville equation, based on 20 years of, of field and laboratory research. That we're going to cover the third week. And then we're going to move on to study or get into the section of measurements. And that would pretty much do with this class. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye bye.